I'm a collector. I've done a lot of scholarly research. Thank you. Sometimes I wait for batteries. That's another <laughs> job description of mine. And here's where I really wanted to start. Um, with me in, does anybody know where this is? Has anybody been here? This is casual, so shut up. Well, now you can see, so there you can see. So this is the island of Naxos in the Cycladas in Greece. And this is the portico of Apollo, built around 530 BC, which was the entrance of a temple that was never completed and faces west toward Delos, where Apollo was born. Um, so I love spending time in the ancient world when I'm able to, um, but also very involved here in Richmond, but love to get back there as soon as I can. So I've always collected something early on, things like maps and Roman coins, um, later developed obviously into things like early American furniture and decorative art. Um, however, um, this was really something that started for me when I came to Richmond. Um, a lot of you all know Richmond for a long time has been a, a hub for auctions and antique shops and all of these sorts of things. We've seen a lot of that go away or change over time, but I really got my start in learning about early American material culture at auctions. and just being able to get my hands on objects. Um, there's no substitution in the furniture decorative arts world for just being able to get your hands on the material culture. You can learn a lot from books, but they only tell you so much. And an English chair can look an awful lot like a Virginia chair. So it's very important to get hands-on experience. So with that, my current research has morphed into a focus on the classical period in Richmond. Now, a lot of studies across the country have been done on different urban centers, like Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York. Um, there hasn't been a lot done on Richmond in this period I'm talking about, which is the late 18th, early 19th century, as far as scholarship goes. There's been things you know, earlier than that, um, but you know, first quarter of the 19th century, isn't so much talked about in Richmond. A lot of people jump from the Revolution and then they jump straight to the Civil War, but in between is where there was a lot of, of flourishing in the arts and the architecture and um, these sorts of things. And so that's where, that's where my focus lies. I previously curated an exhibition at Wilton House Museum and it was titled Collecting, Furni Collecting Furniture in Neoclassical Maryland and Virginia. So most of this furniture in this case is actually Maryland, but you see a lot of similarities between Maryland and Virginia. And this was an exhibition I did in partnership with the Decorative Arts Trust. All these objects are actually from my collection. So this goes back to me being a collector, a scholar, a researcher, all these various things. Combined. So in this exhibit, the focus was really on neoclassicism. Some people wanted me to do an exhibit about being a collector and bring out pieces that needed repairs and were broken. And I said, no, 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 no. We're just going to bring out the best neoclassical stuff. I think that's what everybody wants to see. Although, you know, there's a place for it all. So this exhibit, I'll talk a little bit more about individual objects, but just to take you through really quick the objects in this exhibition, a small exhibition space, obviously, so um, only so much that, that could be done as far as object number, but um, here we have a Heffelwhite Baltimore chair that actually has, hard to see on this photo, but inlay in the middle that mimics an ancient Greek pilot. And you see this is kind of an urn back form, which we'll talk about the classical urn later, sideboard next to it. So this is made in Baltimore. This is a Richmond sideboard. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and it has these classical urn feet. Again, more influence from antiquity. This is a painted chair from Baltimore, which is an ancient Greek form, a Klesimos form, which we'll talk about more later. Grecian sofa, 
also Baltimore, various Hepaloid chairs and card tables, and then we'll end here with this fabulous urn on this Baltimore drum table with these reeded saber legs and brass ball feet. Now, I love a good tall foot, and this one has some really wonderful ones, and we'll talk about the significance of the tall foot um, a little bit later. So this was um, one of my early exhibitions I did at the Wilton House Museum. I'm sure, how many people here have been to Wilton? Did anybody see this exhibit? Oh, okay, good. I guess. <laughs> um, really great to work with Wilton. You know, very early house, um, very significant for the area. And they've been doing a lot of good things as far as events and programs um, that focus on the decorative arts. So it's really um, great to have them in our community. Um, moving on, my next exhibition really focused on this niche of Richmond classical furniture and classical influence in Richmond, mostly in the first quarter of the 19th century, although the story starts a little before that. So this is the most recent exhibition, all Richmond furniture attributed to Richmond and with attributions, as everyone knows, there's no 100%. So a lot of things get attributed to one place, and then there's new scholarship, then they go to another place. Things kind of move around as far as attribution. And at the end of the day, if it's not signed or labeled, or you don't have a bill of sale or a letter, it's hard to tell. Sometimes something just has to be chalked up as being mid-Atlantic. Um, versus Richmond or Petersburg or Norfolk or, or somewhere in Maryland. But most of the pieces in this exhibition um, have some kind of a provenance, some of them are labeled and whatnot. Um, many of these objects have Richmond histories and came from important houses in the region like Brook Hill, um, Belnemus and Powhatan, um, came from Richmond families like the Valentines, all those things help you when you're when you're working on attributing pieces to to Richmond. Now, my goal with this exhibition was to express a breadth of form, styles, and classical motifs. Again, you'll see a pattern here of the focus on classicism. Earlier furniture from Virginia does not quite exhibit these these features that we see in the in the first quarter of the 19th century. Although classicism is something. Um, that, that we see in furniture, you know, from the very beginning. Like I said, many of these objects have never been on display before, and, and we'll talk about more of these objects later. A few I want to point out now are there's two card tables at the back. That's actually a pair that came from Brook Hill, the house on Brook Road. Um, these are very rare because they're both labeled. They have a label that says James Rockwood. They say he was across the street from the Swan Tavern. So it's extreme. A lot of people think that all early furniture is labeled or signed. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. Most of it is not. And so to have a pair of labeled Richmond tables, even to have one would be extraordinary, but to have two is really wonderful. And these had never, to my knowledge, left the house or been on public display before. So. <laughs> Thank you to Brook Hill for letting me borrow these for the exhibition. And, and that's really what you want to see, is you want to have some label pieces of furniture, some sign things, things that have a provenance, so you can build an attribution or build a group. And these two tables exhibit some classic Richmond features like uh, double ring turnings and, and so on and so forth. Now, other pieces that I'll highlight are this sarcophagus form cellaret. Now, this very much looks like a small ancient Roman sarcophagus. You'll also notice it has these paw feet. This is the same sideboard you saw before. It has the urns, has feet. And then we'll talk about most of these objects later, but all of them exhibit neoclassical motifs that you see in antiquity um, up until um, this period. So, most recently, I've been interested in Roman Greece and the idea of this new nation we founded. So, in the you know in the 18th century, after the revolution, 
Americans wanted to be anything but what they were, which was English and British and Scottish and German. They wanted to define themselves and, and pave their own way in history. And so what did they do? They looked back to ancient Greece and Rome, and you see this happen um, over time, I feel like in times of turmoil or in times when, when groups of people ask themselves, who are we or where are we going? They tend to look back to the ancient world. Now, obviously, that's not a hard and fast rule. And obviously, there's a lot of other influences that come into play. In this period, you have influences from cities like Baltimore and Philadelphia. You have pattern books coming over from England and France. So the best way to look at it is not just blindly being ancient Greek or ancient Roman, but kind of being ancient Greek or ancient Roman with a southern accent. So it's all of these things kind of together here that create the objects you see. You know, most of these things are not direct derivatives of ancient furniture, but they do exhibit features of ancient furniture and motifs, not just from furniture, but also from, from decorative art as well. Things like bronzes and ceramics, um, all kinds of motifs come from, from the ancient world and they get used on furniture. Almost everything you can think of shows up at some point. So I want to give just a, a, a quick history of, since we're talking about southern furniture right now, a quick history on furniture in the south. Now, furniture in the south was not always as coveted as it is today. Many of you probably know that. Um, there was an antiques forum in Williamsburg. For those of you who don't know, every year Williamsburg does an antiques forum that's kind of the biggest in the world probably, um, especially for southern furniture and attracts people from all over the country and beyond. And at this particular antiques forum, um, a curator of the Met, who will remain nameless for now, said, and I quote, nothing of merit was made south of Baltimore. <laughs> well, my how can we prove him wrong? <laughs> Southern decorative arts were virtually absent from the first important American decorative arts exhibition held at the Met in 1909, a little over 100 years ago. Subsequently, the now famous story about the American wing curator, Joseph Downs, is his name, in 1949, at the Williamsburg <coughs> Antique Forum, sparked a fire. Very approachment, very appropriate for Richmond, right? Sparking a fire and all that. This prompted the BMFA, our own museum here, to do a groundbreaking exhibition. And this was Furniture of the Old South, 1640 to 1820. So this was a very, anybody here attend that exhibit or remember that exhibit? You guys are too young for that. <laughs> I wish I was here to have seen it. Um, I hope the BMFA will do more things related to Southern furniture and early American furniture in the future. Um, this also prompted, you know, it's amazing when you come from the North and you say something bad about a Southerner, a lot of things happen. This also prompted the creation of MESDA, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, because Frank Gordon was in the audience. So a lot of good things came out of this man's nasty words about Southern furniture. And since then, everything has changed. In 1952, VMFA partnered with Colonial Williamsburg and Antiques Magazine to exhibit 162 pieces of Southern furniture. This completely changed the game. First off, I'd like to provide a little bit of background to this period, which we'll be discussing, the classical period in Richmond. So with that history of Southern furniture in mind, we'll go back even further in time to 1780. So what happens in 1780? The capital of Richmond is moved from Williamsburg to Richmond. And what does Thomas Jefferson do? Builds a Roman temple on a hill. First temple style building in the Western Hemisphere. Hugely significant. The largest building project of the time. So that cannot be underestimated. This is an early view of Richmond that was in the same exhibition you saw that I own. You see the Capitol and you know 
obviously most of these buildings, unfortunately, we've lost from things like fires and urban renewal and those sorts of things. But you can see the capital here is still holding strong. So this is a good place to, to start, and this is kind of the time period that we're talking about. And so the capital was moved to provide a safe haven from the British and a more centrally located position. The Capitol building designed by Jefferson after a Roman temple was the largest public commission under construction in America in the same decade. So of course this led to a huge influx of craftsmen, people to carve the interior woodwork, also people to make the furniture. Now with the influx of craftsmen for such a grand building project, came a plethora of artisans and fundamental change to the original landscape, a movement toward classicism. So I see 1780 in the building of this building as a pivotal moment for Richmond, kind of propelling it onto the world stage, definitely the national stage as far as architecture and craftsmanship, like it had never been before. Before, before then, you know, places like Petersburg and Williamsburg were were the major centers, you know, things are slowly starting to change. In particular, there was a group of craftsmen, Henry Engel, Claude Worthy Stevenson, and William Hodgson. Now, I have another talk where I go into more detail on these early Richmond craftsmen, but for the sake of time, these folks were, one was a British carver, one was an Irish joiner, so they were bringing these European trades to Richmond and they produced really wonderful things. Um, William Hodgson was a British trained artisan who carved woodwork on the Virginia Capitol in private homes. Henry Engel established a shop at the base of Capitol Hill later on after working in Richmond and really built the first, what we think of as a hardware store for the country and Jefferson actually ordered, ordered directly from him. Some of these artisans that worked in Richmond on the state capitol went on to work at the U.S. Capitol, the White House, and various other private homes. And this underscores an important point between the connection of furniture and architecture. So these guys that came to work on the Capitol didn't just work on the Capitol. They also probably made furniture and did various other things. And they got around. They moved back and forth. Um, Henry Engel shows up in Philadelphia and Lord and behold meets Thomas Jefferson, pops up in Avalon County later, so we know what he was working on, UVA and Jefferson's various building projects. So it's amazing how uh, this building, and of course Thomas Jefferson, as a UVA graduate, I don't think I'll ever be able to escape him. I moved to Richmond and my office is right next to this building now. So, so you know, there's worse positions to be. Um, so what's significant about these three men? They produce some of the finest woodwork and carving in the new nation. The noted furniture scholar John Bivens is believed to have reported that he's passed away, but he was really one of the best carvers and scholars of early carving in the 21st century. Um, he believed that what was being made in Richmond in the late 18th century was better than anywhere in the country, and just as good as anything from Philadelphia or New York. And so I think that underscores an important point because when we talk about the late 19th century, we don't always, sorry, late 18th, early 19th century, we don't always consider Richmond. We think about New York and Baltimore and Philadelphia because they were bigger, and they were, but there were definitely things going on here um, that, are, that are worth noting. So, with that, I turn your attention to this urn and flower ornament by William Hodgson, who was mentioned earlier, um, from the late 18th century. It sits atop an English bookcase at the John Marshall House. How many of you all have been to the John Marshall House? Oh, great. Then you've probably seen this. Um, fabulous ornament. Unfortunately, you can see where it's lost some of its tendrils and swags on the side, but what do we have here? An ancient urn form. So, 1790s, we already have these classical motifs being expressed in the architecture and the furniture. So, this is important to note. A lot
lot of the furniture from this period has been lost or dispersed or in private collections. So there's not a lot known about it. Some things have gone missing, but there is enough to kind of determine that things of this quality were being produced here in the late 18th century. William Hodgson also built trusses over the doorways of the Virginia State Capitol. Um, the Masonic canopy at the Randolph Lodge is attributed to Clockworthy Stevenson and William Hodgson. So there's several public buildings in Richmond where, where these guys were working. Here we have the room at the John Marshall House. That's the finial we just spoke about. And then we have other details by William Hodgson. We have ornamentation on the mantel. There's an urn in the center and two erodes on each side symbolizing um, spring and fall, the seasons. And then all around the top we have patera. And what did the pat what did patera come from? Ancient Greek kairos. So, you know, we have these, you know, erodes, Roman cupids, we have these patera on the uh, entablature of the room, we have this classical ornament. Um, this, at the time, was probably one of the greatest rooms in Richmond around 1790, very large room, and is an important survival, really the only one left of this scale. So to quote Benjamin Latrobe, one of my favorite architects, to ancient Greece, the civilized world has never been indebted for more than 2,000 years. In Greece, perfection in the fine arts, freedom in government, and virtue in private life were contemporaneous. So, as we all know, Benjamin Latrobe was a true classicist and thought very highly of, of Greece and Rome. It has been documented in Richmond that New York cabinet makers supplied wood and furniture, hardware to Richmond cabinet makers. Some cabinet makers in Richmond became retailers in northern furniture um, rather than compete, while others and here's the key, did things like import pre-made parts from the north. Sometimes they imported carving, they imported brass. You know, this was a very um, joined up nation and joined up world. There was a lot of commerce, there was a lot of things moving back and forth. So it's important to remember that things weren't just staying in one place. So still many Richmond cabinet makers utilized Things like complex turnings, carvings, simple designs and delicate proportions resulting in their own unique adaptation of regional forms. As the capital of Virginia, sharing a border with a new nation, Richmond furniture really expressed classical taste with more of a southern accent than you see as you move northward. Now, by 1820, over 12,000 individuals resided in Richmond. So Richmond in 1820 was, was a substantial city. In Richmond's early years, merchants dominated the political arena and came to control the city's wealth. As Richmond became a center for tobacco, flour, coal, and iron, many of those buildings we saw earlier in the view down by the river were you know, participating in these trades. It further entwined us with the global economy through shipping and through commerce. In fact, after the revolution, there were even northern cabinet makers that moved south to growing cities like Richmond. Isn't that interesting, Mr. Curator of the Men? <laughs> As with many important cities in America in the first quarter of the 19th centuries, Richmonders were looking to contribute to this national identity, which is the point that I, I keep coming back to because I think it's very important. Now, something else we have going on during this period, which cannot be understated, this is a fabulous painting of a view of the Colosseum. It's very romanticized. But really what it symbolizes for me is the idea of the grand tour. During this period, wealth brought an interest in archaeology and the ancient world. There were people from Virginia in the first quarter of the 19th century that went on a grand tour, not for a month or two, some for a year or two years. So you better believe when they came back after seeing something like this, they wouldn't be able to forget about it. And so 
that's really when you see a lot of these motifs popping up in early Richmond furniture. And it really helped contribute to the development of this unique classical culture first quarter of the 19th century. From birth to death, classicism was even expressed in the form of Greek urns and Roman sarcophagi. Design books were imported from England and France and reinforced these ideas of classicism. Now, it's interesting to look at this period because it doesn't just permeate furniture and architecture. These people in the first part of the 19th century were dressing like the ancients, they were being buried like the ancients in sarcophagi and tombs if they could afford it. So really, from birth to death, not an exaggeration that they were mimicking the ancient Greeks and the Romans, which I think is a really interesting and important point. Now, usage of motifs such as fluting, reading, and canvas leaf carving permeated classical furniture in Richmond. Classical columns appear on clocks and card tables and washstands. The iron form, like you saw before, um, was not only used as the central pedestal for candle stands and tea tables, but even for case pieces, like the sideboard that you saw. The use of dramatic cloth feet go all the way back to the Greeks, the Etruscans, and the Romans, and even earlier to the Egyptians. So you see recycling even happening among the ancients. Now I'd like to go into a little bit more depth about these classical motifs and draw some parallels between the ancient world and the first quarter of the of the 19th century. Here we have columns from the very exhibit we have in this building, from Pompeii. These are reconstructed, obviously, but you'll notice this, what you call fluting, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And it's amazing how we see fluting and reading turn up in the first quarter of the 19th century all over furniture. You see here, on the legs here, and then also this form of a column with the turning at the top for the pediment expressed here on this clock. This was made by Jerome Chauncey, um, a Richmond retailer. Um, has a reverse painted tablet on the front that has his name it's labeled inside, Richmond, Virginia. This is really exploding with classical influence. And in my exhibition, it you know, was right smack in the middle because I wanted people to be smacked in the face with Richmond and all this classicism. So from top to bottom, we have this cornice that's reminiscent of Egyptian architecture. We have these elaborate ionic columns we have around the painted dial, Anthemian, which are palmettes that go all the way back to ancient, ancient Egypt, really. Um, but the Greeks and the Romans act, absolutely love them and slap them all over everything. And they're really beautiful here along, along the corners of the dial. Moving further down, you see Paul Feet. So this, this really is a great place to start because this exhibits a lot of the things we're talking about here. But even things that are a little less noticeable, like this Richmond washstand, I should point out all the examples I'm going to be using are specific to Richmond. Things that I believe were made in Richmond or attributed to Richmond. And, I, and where I could, I've tried to make parallels with things like these columns that are in Richmond. Um, there's some parallels from the BMFA and collections that we're all familiar with, and all of the photos or mine, unless otherwise it doesn't. So this washstand also exhibits a column form with the turning at the top. So you can think of the turning as kind of the capital of the column, but you know, much less dramatic, much more delicate than something that's, you know, readed like this here. But we see this turn up all over Richmond and other urban centers in America. The next motif is classical urns, which I really love the urn form, and you see it everywhere. This is a good place to start a fabulous, monumental, South Italian Greek urn that's not quite as tall as me, but you know, not too far off, believe it or not. 
This was in a recent exhibit at the, the MFA, the Horse and Greek Art, which a lot of you probably saw. Um, I had the opportunity to help with that exhibit a little bit and to host an event for it to kind of raise awareness for, um, for the fact that the MFA actually has an amazing collection of South Italian Greek art that they've been building for quite a while. And so it was great to be able to do an event with the VMFA. So this is a great example of a monumental urn. And what do we have in early American furniture? 18th century, we have the urn finial. Early 19th century, Richmond tea table urn for the pedestal. Not to mention the saber legs with, with breeding. Then we also have urns for feet on the side. So the urn is something that you see not only in tables and sideboards, you see chairs with the back flat in the shape of an urn, you see it everywhere. And it's one of my favorite forms. And mimicking things like Greek black figure pottery, all the way to urns from Rome made of marble. I didn't see any urns in the exhibit here. Otherwise, I probably would have, would have put one on this slide. Next, we have the classical hall foot, which we've spoken about a few times already. Great examples in this exhibition. Several, actually. This was my favorite. This Greek, sorry, Roman hall foot in bronze which is really spectacular, the highest quality, fabulously casted, um, really worth seeing if you haven't seen the exhibit yet. Also, there's several tripods in the exhibition, also made of bronze, that exhibit this, this classical tall foot. And so, what do we have in early America? We talked about the clock and the tall feet, but we have this believed to be a Richmond made card table. Now they made these in Richmond and Norfolk, and there was a lot of back and forth between the two, but based on what we know, we believe this to be a Richmond example. Same really wonderful card Paul foot. Here's the detail shot of that. You know, it's got, you know, th this is more called a hairy Paul foot. It's got, it's got nails and hair on the foot. Um, really spectacular carving for Richmond during this period. Then, again, a detailed foot of the clock. And this foot even goes as far as to have leaf carving on the side, and you can see the little ball behind it below this column. So you have this claw foot really, really permeating a lot of early American furniture. Now the last example I'll talk about, I've talked a lot about motifs and furniture, from the urn, to the endymion, to the top foot, to the fluting and the reading. But how about forms from antiquity that the early Americans straight up copied? Well, here's one, the Clisimus chair. I'm sure many of you have seen this form before with this curved back. Now, again, these are all my photos, but they're not my pieces, unfortunately because they're very rare. <laughs> now, this one is one of my favorites, which also opens another discussion about the fact that in early America, major urban centers were mimicking one another, doing some of the same things, making some of the same forms, but with their own kind of twist. So from left to right, we have a chair made in Baltimore by the Finley Brothers, which were famous furniture makers in Baltimore, really the best painted furniture makers in early America. Um, a lot of the time you see griffins painted. You also see things like anthemians on the side and all kinds of classical designs. So not only is it a classical form, they've kicked it up a notch and taken a classical form and painted classical things all over it. Now moving to this one, we see Griffins again. This is a Philadelphia example, believed to have been at least based 
on a design by Benjamin Latrobe for the White House. So one of my favorite pieces of furniture, really speaking to the fact that in this period, the early 19th century, all the way up to the White House, we were trying to be ancient Greek and Roman with our furniture forms, our architecture, etc. Um, but this is a really fabulous painted chair, also in the Klesmos form. Now, these chairs, if you go back to antiquity, existed in this form. One of the ways we know that is because we see them depicted on black figure pottery. There's a great example at the BMFA of a Kylix. When you look into it, it has a man sitting down in the Klesmos chair, this form, and his servant is pouring, pouring wine into his Kylix. So we have a lot of depictions on pottery. Um, we have depictions in stone, etc., of this chair, very well documented as a Greek Klesmos form. Now, I'll leave you with the one in the middle, which is a little bit of a question mark. It's one in my collection, it was in the Richmond Furniture Exhibition, and I believe to have been possibly made in Richmond. We know they were making painted furniture here. We know they were making a lot of the same things here that they were making in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York. This one, you can't quite see it, but has a nice scene on the back. It has an anthemium in the middle of the crest. And so really great classical motifs on this classical form. It's oxidized over time, it's gotten darker, but if you were to see it in person, you'd notice a faux rosewood finish painted on full of poplar wood. So this really gets to the point of the fact that this ancient form, the Klesmos chair from Greece, was being made in Baltimore, Philadelphia, other places like Richmond. Not just using the form, but also using paint to express the ideals of classicism. They were so intertwined with. Now with that, I'll leave you with a quote from one of my favorite Richmonder, Edgar Allan Poe, to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was wrong. Thank you.